Good morning, and welcome to the Not On My Watch show. This is Dr. Baruch, and um, we are working it out today. We are. Wor- I'm not even going to tell y'all what it is that has already happened today, or didn't happen today, but it's going to be a good show, nonetheless. This is the Not On My Watch show. As um, oftentimes I, I kind of shift gears from entertainment to edutainment to health literacy to just what the heck is on my mind at the moment. So today, um, I call it not on my watch, but I'm going to integrate health into this conversation and uh, there's a presentation that I'm going to be doing I'll give you all a little glimpse of it there there's a presentation that I'm going to be doing that's going to talk a little bit about some things that I think are critical and um, and need to be addressed in our community in in the um, especially for those of us who are really desirous of change I think we we have a I think we have problems that we are not addressing and we're choosing to address problems or situations that really don't have the kind of significant impact on us that um, I think we need to we need right now in our community we need to have impact we need to stop playing around with the fringes we need to stop acting like It ain't crazy because it's crazy. We need to start acting like this is really a serious crisis and we need to start moving on it aggressively. It is a shame and it is, um, it is embarrassing that we can boast and brag about the great accomplishments that we've made over the course of history. And, um, and now we look up and we find ourselves where we are today. So, Presentation is uh, your health is your wealth. Your health is your wealth. And um, truly your health is your wealth. And we're going to discuss that today. And we're going to we're going to discuss what we need to do in order to uh, in order to uh, make the pri- make this a priority. So let me go back to the presentation, and we're going to jump into the subject matter. You know, health is such a a, a critical issue, and it, it, it tends to only become critical in our minds after we have a problem. When we don't have a problem, health is not a problem. Nobody's talking about it. But uh, truly, your health is is one of your most valuable assets, and uh, it's one in which we need to commit more of our energy and time to. And um, it being a um, a year where we are assessing and evaluating what is really important and what we should really be doing, I think it's um, it's it's important that we go over some things, especially for me, it's important that we go over some things that are, um, are having a, a very negative impact on us. And, you know, I, I, I use the example of uh, choking on a gnat and swallowing the camel. And I don't want to make light of anything, but we tend to do that as a rule and we tend to make a big deal out of that which isn't the biggest deal although it's a big deal it's not the biggest deal we make a big deal out of stuff and spend a whole lot of energy fussing fighting protesting arguing sitting in getting locked up fighting getting killed and the bigger issue continues to roll forward so with regard to um the the subject matter of the day health and wellness um, and it is it is critical in 2016 that we stop lo- allowing the media to determine what is most critical for us 
building wealth isn't just about money. Uh, it's, it's about also your minimizing your risk and your exposure. And in our community, and when I say our, I think you know I'm talking about. If you don't, then it might not be you that I'm talking about. That um, in our community, the, the exposure that we have behind doing things that we, in our mind, have determined are what we should do for pleasure because life is hard and life is stressful and life is mean and life is tough. And so we just believe that we should be in pursuit of this pleasure thing. So we pursue after pleasure and we pursue after pleasure at the, at the um, demise or destruction of that which would ever produce a better outcome for us overall, such that we would never need to then have this pleasurable escape. And you know, the pleasurable escapes are all destructive, that somehow somebody's defined for us that, okay, um, you should engage in destructive, self-destructive behavior every time you have a tough time. So you think about it, you think about the vices that we engage in and you, you realize that we're, we're exposing ourselves and we're, we're making things more difficult for ourselves as we seek to run from the situation that is, is a problem, rather than confronting the situation, addressing it, putting it behind us and moving forward. So I find that we are, and, and I would, I'm gonna go into it, maybe not in this presentation, but I want you all to understand that dietarily, you can be induced to be non-confrontational dietarily you can be induced to be non-confrontational to the point where it makes sense for you to hit yourself in the head when somebody else is doing something to you it would make sense to you when you are non-confrontational and when you are are in a situation where somebody is putting great pressure on you it makes sense to you when these natural uh life-saving and, and life-preserving qualities have been diminished inside of you, it makes sense of you to then work against yourself along with them in order to somehow convey to them that you're willing to do more harm to yourself than they're willing to do to you. And that being the case, then they should stop. Really? Where does that make sense? Who taught us that? And 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 why do why have we decided to perfect it to such a degree so um risk that will deplete your hard earned resources your life that was that was the example i was giving. many aspects of poor health drain our resources and that that element of draining your resources we look up and people spend uh, I, I think the statistics were up to 80 percent of our resources are spent over the course of the last 14 months of most of our family and friends' lifetime, uh, lives. So the last 14 months of our life, we spend over 80% of our, our accumulated wealth. That is crazy, but that's where we are. We pay others who promise us good health, can cost us thousands, you know, and which, which costs us thousands over the course of our lives, yet our life, our health is getting worse. Let me, let me restate that because that sounds a little confusing. We put our hope, our trust, and our money in the hands of people who've demonstrated since day one that they don't have our best interest at heart, that they're charging us not to make us well, but to keep us marginally sick such that you know we could maybe one day you know experience some degree of normalcy but not really because they never want to let go of us they want to hold on to us which uh which is crazy but again that's that's where we find ourselves and in 2016 we have be become dependent upon a sick care system it's about sick care and the management of the sick. It's not about wellness. It's not about health. It's not about prevention. It's about once you got it, let's allow you to keep it, but still 
uh, keep you functioning enough that you could afford to pay your doctor bill. That is, that's slavery. That's, that's medical and, and pharmaceutical slavery that we, we find ourselves engaged in now. So um, physicians treat their patients like human ATM machines. And you know how that is. Uh, there was a time when you would go to a medical doctor, and those of us who are old enough to remember, you could go into your doctor's office and you had a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour to sit down and talk to your doctor about what's going on, not only with regard to your health, but your life. You know, you developed a relationship. This was a guy who you were entrusting with your life, and you developed a relationship with him. And uh, nowadays, it's like eight minutes in and out. What? Hi, Miss Johnson. How are you? Great. What is your problem today? How can I help you? Okay, good. I'm going to prescribe this, this, and this. Does this hurt? Okay, good. I'm going to prescribe this, and uh, you tell me how that works for you. Give me a call back in a couple of days. Tell me how that works for you, and uh, yeah, and we'll see you in two weeks. Let's plan on you coming back in two weeks so we can reassess uh, where you are with regard to this problem. Crazy. If you, had that, if you had that same scenario play out with regard to your car, there's no way you would take your car to the shop. Not to that shop again. So it is, um, it's, this, it's, it's high time that we wake up and stop playing games with our health. Our health is critical. And it's, it's time that we stop playing games with our health and we make our health a priority. And uh, if we don't, then we're going to uh, we're going to continue to experience these problems that we're experiencing. So I realized just uh, in that last slide that you all are not getting the graphical images that are on each of these slides, which makes it a little difficult to convey the energy. So let me see whether I can fix that. I don't know why that's going on, but. Um, <sighs> You know, the, the healthcare system is an illusion. And the illusion of us going to somebody to improve our health or our quality of life, who makes money off of keeping us sick, that is bizarre and crazy. That's an illusion. I think we fixed it. So now you can see the images. Um, that's an illusion. Somebody who makes money, who's got to maintain their child's tuition at Harvard, who's got to, you know, do whatever else they're doing to support their, their lifestyle, their car, their house, or what have you, they're, um, they, are, they are obviously charging you so that they could, uh, they could maintain their lifestyle. So it is only natural that they would want to keep you on as, as, a, as a human ATM machine. It makes sense. It makes sense that they would want to keep you a human ATM machine. So why do we continue to call the healthcare, uh, call it healthcare when people aren't getting any better? And you know, you get you oh, when somebody goes to the hospital, oh Lord, so many people go to the hospital and we never see them again. They never come out. They don't get better. They get worse. They go in with a with a. a finger that is is infected and they come out with pneumonia and streptococcus and and any other infections that are prevalent in the hospital that of course a, a, a hospital should be able to prevent people from uh, getting they get a staph infection they get any number of illnesses while they're there in the place of health health and wellness the, in the place where they're supposed to be getting better they're getting worse. That's crazy. But that's where we are. And if we don't wake up, we're going to stay there. You know, as a community of people, we're going to stay there. And I, and I pray that we get it. And I pray that this, you know, this opens up our, our minds and our hearts to understand the, the significance of what's taking place in our community. This is, this is ridiculous. And we trust it. And people come to me. You know, people have the audacity to come to me after, you know, when they, when they first get sick, they come to me. And then after they've been sick, you know, for years, trying to figure out how to make this thing work, after I've told them, I said, look, you know, that system is, uh, is, uh, is not working in your best interest. 
that is not going to work in your best interest. You might need to consider doing something different. And then, of course, people come to me at the 11th hour and tell me that uh, it ain't working. And I'm like, okay, at what point didn't you think I was telling you the truth? At what point did you think that I was just, you know, I, I was trying to keep you in, in this perpetual cycle of sickness and pain? And well, at what point do, don't you recognize the purpose of, you know, those of us who are healers in our community? You know, we built we, we build businesses, we build enterprises to help support the health and wellness in our community. And then the people in our community go and support or go for care at other institutions and then wonder why our institutions that are in our community to support the wellness of our community that have every reason to see our people get better, we wonder why those businesses don't grow. Well, the reason why they don't grow is because they don't get supported. Because we spend all of our resources and our energy, we spend all of that with other folk. And when you spend all that with other folk, no, it's not going to get better at all. It's going to get worse. It's gonna, we're going to see, you know, health practitioners get worse. And, and their quality, the quality of what it is that they, they have to share is going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And that becomes a, a tough pill because it, at some point you've got to trust and we don't trust. Uh, I, don't, I don't trust. I'm, I'm going to go to the guy that I know is not doing me well, that I know is not going to give me the best care, that I know is not going to, that, it, that doesn't agree with what I agree with with regard to health and wellness. I'm going to go to him to get better. Oh, boy. You know, um, what, what do you say? What do you say? How do, how do, we, how do we then make that make sense? That in 2016, after, you know, um, in 1960, people of color didn't have diabetes, you know. In 1960, if you got high blood pressure, you, you know, you ate some garlic or some apple cider vinegar or some, you know, one of the diuretic teas that you would consume, and you got rid of the high blood pressure. You know, we didn't have issues with cholesterol because we didn't have the resources to consume the amount of meat that other people were consuming. Now that we're consuming so much of it, now we have cholesterol issues. Um, you know, how did we find ourselves where we are today? We, we have to understand that there is, a, there is a system that's in place to cause us or encourage us and, and guide us into failure. And regardless of what you might think, there is a system in place to cause us to fail. And it's up to us to disengage from that system and, and engage in a system that supports us on the road to being healthy and being better and being stronger and being more vibrant. <clears throat> we, we have to disconnect from these systems that are destroying our health. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that becomes tough because you want to... You want to you wanna believe that, no, 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 no. These doctors are board certified. They are qualified. They went to Harvard and Yale, and they, they graduated whatever in their class. So I know that they are on top of their game. I know that they are the best of the best. And um, I just say, well, look at the statistics. You know, look at, look at the health of the citizenry in the United States of America. Can you truly say that? that America, uh, that the American healthcare system is working for, not just everybody, is it working for us? You know, is it working for us? I don't see it working for us. I don't see it working, I don't see it working for anybody, but I definitely don't see it working for us. So um, we, uh, we, have some, uh, we have some work to do. You all, you all bear with me as I, I deal with this technical thing that is going to get worked out in just a minute. Um, should be a little button on here that says present. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, again, a healthcare system that has demonstrated that it doesn't look out for our well-being is one that you see, you know, they're, they're building new hospitals. That's, that's progress. And when, when you see that, uh, uh, a system is building new hospitals, that's not progress for you. 
that's not the system that you need to be investing your time and energy in. You know, you don't, you don't need to be a part of that. You need to be a part of a system that is getting people well. If you get a referral, you know, Angie's List. You know, you call Angie's List in order to find out how well somebody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. If the guy putting up gutters on houses got a bad rating, you don't hire him. If you go to your medical doctor and say, well, hey, doc, you know, I realize that, you know, you've been doing this for a while. How many people have died in your care? You know what that medical doctor's going to do? He's going to kick you out of his office. The nerve of you, the audacity of you to come in and challenge me and my authority over you and your body and your health care. The nerve of you to think that you could come to me and talk about, you know, uh, my, my credentials or, or what it is that I'm doing or not doing or how well I'm doing, what I'm doing, how many people have died. And this is your life. This is your life. And you have a problem asking the person who's your, whose hands you're putting your life in how well you've been doing. That's crazy. There needs to be a doctor's Angie's list. Um, so why do we continue to call it uh, a health care system when people aren't getting better? Because we are... We have been subdued to the point where we don't have any more fight in us. We are like, we are like cattle being herded. We just go because we don't want to create a fuss. So when you hear somebody talking like me, you don't want to hear this conversation. You want to hear somebody who's toting the line. Yeah, I went to the doctor. I got chemo and radiation and surgery. He says I got about six months to live, and I, I got to get my affairs together. But I got, you know, six months to live, and in those six months, they're going to give me another 28 cycles of, you know, chemotherapy that's going to cost me $280,000. But I got it, so no, no, no worries. You know, whatever happened to prevention? You know, back in the day, what is it? An ounce of prevention is worth a, a pound of cure. We aren't there anymore. It's not enticing, an enticing option for most people. You know, we don't get excited about prevention. It's almost like we want to show people that, yeah, I got good insurance. I got good insurance. And uh, look, I'm going to show you my insurance. I got, you know, I've had surgery five times on my cancer because I, I haven't had to pay a dime. Yeah, right. But your prostate is removed, and now you can't function as a man. You, you, and now you, you haven't had to pay a dime. And then you add up the rising cost of sick care, and then you see where all of the money is going in our community. We're sick, and, and, and we don't get old and die anymore. We get sick and die. So here it is. We're getting sick, and after getting sick, all of our resources are leaving our community, and they're going, and, and, and we're, we're finding ourselves pfft, without the capacity to even extend the, the, to the family, the financial support to even put us in the ground. We ain't got that money. If you're a person of African descent, your chances of developing a lifestyle-related disease is, is almost guaranteed if you don't take measures to prevent it. And why is it so guaranteed? It's because of the things that we do. The life that we live, we live a very um, carefree and careless life. We think we can eat anything. We think that we can, we can do anything. We think all of it is, all we got to do is, and this goes into our belief system, all we have to do is go to church and ask for forgiveness. And it all gets washed away. That's, that's what we think. That's what somebody has convinced us of. What are some of the ways that we can engage in health-promoting practices now so that we don't have to pay the price later? Food, exercise, and healthy relationships. Well, I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump around a little bit here because um, I think that's an understatement, and and it makes it it oversimplifies it, you know, and it makes it you feel like well, pff, I don't have to do a whole lot of anything. All I gotta do is you know, and 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 all of those become uh, relative. So food. Well, I eat healthy food. Well, what's your what's your definition of healthy food? It is completely different from most times people's definition of of healthy food is completely different than mine. Exercise. Well, I, you know, I walk up this, the steps to my apartment every day, so I get exercise in. And healthy relationships. I got a couple, you know, I got a couple of those. Come on, man. 
we don't have healthy relationships. We're not building families. We're not, we're not supporting the continuation of our bloodline. We're not supporting the, the, the children that we've given birth to. We're not supporting them and raising them and helping them perpetuate what it is that's been put into you. You don't see them as a continuation of you. You see them as a burden. You see them as a problem. You don't want to be connected to that. That's a, that's a big deal. I, I took some notes, and I want to share with you some of the notes. And um, I, I just think that I, I need to ask this question. I run into a lot of people who are uh, aggressive, and they, they feel like they, they're ready to confront the system, and they're strong, and they're stomped down, and they're mean. Well, this is one of the questions I ask. Um, uh, who do you work for? What do you eat? And who do you do business with? And all of a sudden, you see a, a, a so-called revolutionary begin to break down. And where does this impact? This impacts all of what I just got finished talking about uh, is, is about relationships. One, it's a relationship with the person that you toil for in order to get your resources to take care of yourself. And then it's a relationship with the person that provides you with nutrition, supposedly. And then there's the, um, there's the person that you uh, support and, and that you, you support these institutions. What institutions are you supporting? So with regard to the African American in the United States of America, um, and, and this is a segue from what it is that we're talking about, but you're going to see how it fits together, that if we supported black businesses, if we supported African-American-owned businesses that support us, and that's a key ingredient, if the business supports you and you supported it, then what you're going to find is unemployment in our community goes to zero. The other day I was riding around in Baltimore. Baltimore is like a throwback. I was in Baltimore. I don't know what neighborhood I was in. But on every single corner, you saw pockets of 10, 15, 25, 50 people standing around cold, smoking and drinking, with looking like they don't have a job, they don't have a purpose, they don't have anything going on. So their relationship with their, their selves and their purpose is gone. It's deteriorating. They spent their bank account. They spent their, 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 um, their purpose bank account on something that has no value that will not support them and again when we find ourselves in that space we don't exercise because we don't consider ourselves worthy we don't have the appropriate levels of self-worth to want to eat the right foods we don't have the appropriate levels of of self-worth in order to have healthy relationships so we become predators in our community <sighs> will you be around to recover all the money you've re invested in your retirement we yeah we're, we're around to spend it we spend all the money that you know that residual income after working for the government for 40 years we spend that money but we spend it on you know trying to prevent um you know some chronic disease from taking us out of here that's crazy and that makes sense to people that makes sense why and then we don't have anything we don't have anything to invest in our future. So, you know, you got, you got family members who are having to sell the house just so that they can cover funeral costs, just so that they can cover the debt, just so that they can, they can you know, just cover the expense of saying goodbye to you. No, that's not how this should work. A little bit about my story. Um, I, I was exposed to uh, a... Um, a way of eating very on early on in life. Eating healthy uh, was was a requirement. You know, I I learned in the second grade. My second grade teacher challenged me one day. I was eating a pork chop sandwich, and she was questioning, you know, why I would eat a pork chop sandwich and how bad pork was for me. Well, little did she know, I was so enamored and in love with her that. All she had to do was let me know that she wasn't pleased and I was done with that pork chop sandwich. I was, I was ready to put it away. I, was, I would never eat it again because I didn't want to damage my relationship with Miss Williams, my second grade teacher. And um, from there, it started a cycle. So, you know, when we think about educators, 
you know, the impact that educators can have on you that really care about you. This woman has literally altered my entire life. From that one conversation, my entire life pivoted. And now I find myself owning healthy restaurants. I find myself eating healthy ever since then. I, I eventually became a vegan. And um, 39 years now, I've been consuming fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables. And the, the impact of that one conversation, which you would think had everything to do with food, but for me, as I reflect back on it, it didn't have anything to do with food at all. It had everything to do with how I felt about myself. And how I felt about myself needed to be upgraded based on how she felt uh, I was treating myself. So uh, I, I just want to talk a little bit about um, a business that I opened up in Northwest Washington, D.C. called Evolve. I opened up Evolve and, you know, I tried to make it fit into the community. And what I learned here in the last probably two to three months is that I, I probably made a mistake. I should have created the business model that I was accustomed to. I should have just opened what I already do and do it the way that I do and, and do it the best that I can. So now we're seeing a transition in that evolved location uh, to now fit the model of the parent business, that, uh, which is Everlasting Life, to fit that model. So a little bit about some of the things that I've, I've dealt with. And I think it has to do with support. You know, I don't get the kind of support from that community that I thought I was going to get. Tacoma Park is supposed to have the largest uh, population of vegans in the area, the largest po population of animal rights activists in the area, the largest population of climate change activists in the area. Well, and I'm, I'm going to say this without doing any scientific research, but just doing my own personal research, I find that I believe that um, maybe who I am uh, was a little bit more important to those folk rather than what I was doing. And their activism, their human, I mean, their, their animal rights activism didn't quite trump how they feel about people like me. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, Everlasting Life, of course, is the business that I started in, two, in 1995 in my garage, opened up this location that you see here in 2001, and have been here in Capitol Heights serving an underserved and disserved community ever since. We've got 18 restaurants here on this corridor coming out of Washington, D.C., out to the Beltway. There's only one healthy one, and there's only one that at lunchtime doesn't have the line that you see at all the others. And um, there's also a reason and a direct correlation with that line and the, or, or the lines at the others and the number of people that are suffering from health, di health disparities, health conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, heart disease. There's a direct correlation that most of us don't even make the connection to. Uh, how to sustain, you know, what it is that I've done for the last 20 years hasn't been easy, but a big part of it has been education. You know, we felt the need to educate people so that they would have a better understanding about um, their health and about how they could take charge of their health. Also, giving back. You know, you all have seen us with the food truck go into the hood and just give away free food and let people, you know, taste healthy food. Some of them for the first time tasting what, you know, some vegetables prepared properly without fat back and and without hog mogs and without chicken and without whatever else in the food, they get a chance to experience the taste and realize that, whoa, this tastes good. And no, we don't expect them to, uh, you know, have the immediate resources to start spending $10, $15 a day on their lunch. But we do at least expose them to the reality that when they do get there, and we pray that they all do, that, uh, you know, they're going to have, they, they'll have a place where they can go and they can support wellness in their body. So again, what, what we're talking about today is health and wealth. We're not just talking about health, but how it is impacting our wealth. And um, I think our wealth is, is important in this conversation because if you don't have sufficient resources, financial resources or wealth, 
then your health is going to be compromised. You're going to be stressed and you're not going to spend the kind of money that you need to be spending on your well-being. And if you're one of those who spend more money on your cell phone plan and your cable plan and your shoes and your hair and your nails and your rims on your car, then, you know, this conversation probably doesn't make any sense to you. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, how am I going to have money in order to do all that other stuff? I can go and get a crappy meal at Crackdonald's and I'm good. Come on, man. Let's wake up. That, that, uh, that hasn't worked and it's not going to work. We also, as you see here, we, we built this institution, eLife Media, so that we could have a control over the intellectual content, over the food that you consume in your mind. And we built this so that uh, we could begin to change the conversation, change the narrative. We got tired of us being projected in the media as negative, being projected in the media as slothful and lazy and and not wanting to do anything and, and always being angry and always doing things that are self-destructive. So we bring attention to people that are doing really positive things and we also expose the world to this, this person and we expose the people that tend to look at programming like this to some positive things that would uplift and empower them as well. So it's, it's working on several levels. Um, I would definitely say we need a community of like-minded individuals in order for us to move forward. Um, I, 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 could, I could have been a vegan and I could have decided to be healthy with my children, but at some point I looked around and I said, well, wait a minute, if I'm only concerned about myself and I don't concern myself about others, who will my children marry? Who will my children continue this legacy with? You know, if I don't make this known, the importance and significance of a healthy diet, who are my children going to be able to relate to? So it wasn't that I'm the only one that's doing it, but I definitely saw the need for me to do it. So as opposed to running the race and just deciding that I'm going to live to 250 years of age, well, let me, let me go ahead and get some other people of this mindset so I don't have to keep going to funerals. I might have some folk that can hang out with me. And likewise with uh, with my children, economic uh, economic empowerment through collective engagement is real important. We all have a collective responsibility. If I have no customers, I have no business. I will not grow my business without customers. I need customers in order to grow my business. I need customers to be happy. I need customers to want to come back. I need customers to want to tell their friends and family and loved ones and have events. Tomorrow everybody's going to be eating whatever they're eating. They're those of us who are my customers who say, look, I'll come and get what you got because I can't eat what they're going to be eating. And, uh, you know, every year we, we see this cycle repeat itself that people are saying, you know, I, I, I went to the, for, you know, to, for the holiday I went to go with the family and they put chicken and turkey and pork and beef and everything there's nothing I can eat that's truly vegan so we uh, we give them that opportunity to engage a business that supports their lifestyle um, I think uh, probably one of the most significant things that I'm seeing myself doing going forward is business health and life coaching that uh, some of us don't get it and you need to hear it from somebody that's been there so that you can get it. Somebody needs to shine the light on the path so that you can get what the deal is, so you can figure out what you need to do in order that you don't fall into the uh, problems that many of us do. Some of us don't have that need to, um, what do you call it, you know, for experience to be their best teacher. Some of us are cool with realizing that, okay, well, if you experienced it, then that's enough for me. I just need to know what you did or didn't do so that I can at least be that much further along. And that's a, I think that's a responsibility of family, and that's a responsibility of community. And uh, as an active part of the community, I'm very interested in helping people get this health and business and life thing right. Let's get this health and business and life thing right so that we can stop faking and we can move forward. Uh, just a couple of things. You know, these are the, the, the businesses that I have. That's uh, Everlasting Life, 21 years now we've been in business. As a matter of fact, this is our birthday month. So, uh, yeah, 21 years in the business. 
and um, then we've got Evolve, which is now going on three years old, and we got Vigoritos. And Evolve is was a full service sit down restaurant. Now again, it's transitioning to being more of what we do here at Everlasting Life, where we're able to offer a broader cross section of food, and also. Um, be able to provide people with much, much, much uh, better quality of service, you know, as they come through the restaurant. It's, uh, I find it to be a, a better business model. And Vigoritos is um, a, bur a vegan burrito shop, you know, and they're, they're all located in the D.C. area. Let me give you the location. So Everlasting Life is 9185 Central Avenue in Capitol Heights, Maryland. Evolve is right next to the Tacoma Park Metro Station at 341 Cedar Street, and about 100 feet away, maybe 100 yards away is more accurate, is Vigoritos, which is at 6904 4th Street in Northwest Washington, D.C., just down from the Tacoma Station uh, nightclub. Who am I? I'm Dr. Baruch. I'm a naturopath. I'm an educator, health literacy expert, author, entrepreneur, TV and radio personality, and just um, a young guy that grew up in Southeast Washington, D.C., that decided that um, I needed to make a difference. And so this on this platform, using this platform, I've decided this is how I could make a difference. This is how I could change people's lives. This is how I could help people do better. And that's what we do. That's what we do here. Um, uh, before, I, before I leave you, uh, I want to leave you with a couple more tidbits of, uh, of advice. And uh, again, experience does not have to be your teacher. You can learn from my experiences. And uh, it's time for us to, us to start reading and learning and passing down information and sharing and, and getting information from people that uh, have already lived this life. Uh, you know, we, we, we just completed a, a pretty interesting political uh, show in the United States of America. We just completed a very interesting political show. And I think you, you've got to start asking yourself a question. You know, I've seen, I've seen people boast and brag and beat their chest about how tough and mean and strong and how much they're against people that are against them. And then they tell me who they work for. And immediately it deflates all of that aggression. Even in their mind, they realize, oh, man. I didn't think about that. But what you want me to do, quit? What you want me to do, you know? I got to eat. Yeah. Oh, I get that. But if we're going to support, if we're going to give our work and effort and energy to institutions that don't look out for our best interests, isn't something wrong with that? Because you don't want them to go away. You don't want them to fail. You don't want them to not do what they do. And what they do is in direct opposition to you. So that's, uh, that's something that we have to look at. So all you strong revolutionaries with your fist up in the air talking about how tough you are, mm, who do you work for? And who do they vote for? You know, here it is, you put all that energy into this campaign, you just knew your candidate was going to win or whatever you were thinking, and whoever your candidate was, maybe your candidate did win. But you, you have to look at the, the, the institution that you commit your energy to if they are voting in opposition to you, why are you working for them? Hmm. Uh, and I think a, a real linchpin in all of this is who teaches your children? Who's educating your children? That's the next wave of you. That's, that's you reinvented going forward. They're going to continue your ideals, your rituals, your customs, your bloodline, your, your, your family, your legacy is going to be continued through them. Who's teaching them? And if the person that's teaching them does not have your best interest at heart, then what are they teaching them to do? 
And if you look up in 2016 and see that our children are, t are seemingly on a path to not only just self-destruct, but take a whole lot of other folk down with them, chances are that they're being educated by the wrong system. They're being educated by a system that wants them to self-destruct. And I don't mean just self-destruct because there's murder on the street. I don't mean self-destruct because they, they didn't get a job. I mean self-destruct because of all of that. And for me in the health space, you know, they're not teaching them the appropriate levels of self-worth so that the conversation about you should eat healthy and they know what healthy is and they know what healthy isn't they should eat healthy or they should eat healthier becomes an argument. Something's wrong with that. Something is wrong with that reality. So, um, I'm going to jump back in and close this out. I think I just have one more. Yep, one more slide. So, I, I want to thank all of you for indulging me. And there's a lot more to this, but I try to make it like radio ready so that uh, it can get distributed without me losing friends and family and customers. And I say that just because some people don't understand what it takes to, um, to fight this fight. And some people don't even think they're in the middle of a fight. They think this is peacetime and everything is good and everything's getting better. And we've come a long way and we're, we're on the road to getting better. And some of us are, are deluded into believing that, you know, one, we believe that we don't have to do anything for it to get better because somebody else is going to come out the sky and do that for us. So we don't have to do any work. All we have to do is just believe. If that isn't some hocus pocus, tell me what else you can just believe and it happens. How about, you know, just going outside and believing that it's going to get hot today? Or, you know, going in the kitchen and leaving everything where it is and just believing that the food is going to get fixed. Just believe it. Just sit there and believe it. And if you believe it long enough, and if you believe it hard enough, then maybe it's going to get fixed. How about laying in your bed and just believing you're going to be able to keep your job? It doesn't work. Except when we believe in the mythology and the spooky and the, and the, and the things that we can't verify and qualify, then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, that, that's how that works. Got to be careful what you believe. Again, this is uh, Dr. Baruch. This has been the Not On My Watch show. And uh, we got some, some guests that are going to be coming in the studio in just a moment. We're going to talk to us about some events that are coming up here at Everlasting Life. So uh, you all stay tuned. I think what I'll do is maybe give you a little bit of music to listen to and, um, and let you all jam until they begin to uh, get all set up in here. But again, I, I really want you to understand your responsibility to yourself. Nobody else has the same level of responsibility to you that you do. We have to get off of this pleasure trip and we have to start getting on this purpose. The purpose. We have a purpose in life and we need to be engaging that purpose. We, not to, we don't need to all day long all of our life be in pursuit of that which gives us pleasure and that is the only thing that we think is important because if you do that and if you think that way and if that's where your head is then you are going to really hurt your next generation so with that I want to thank you all for uh, again listening to me as I get on my soapbox and I do my thing and uh, I'm going to leave y'all with a little bit of music so y'all can jam, get me off the picture here, and again, thank you. Peace. Your life. It's my life. It's E-Life Media, powered by live music for you. 